way of introduction, I just wanted to make a few remarks. And then uh, I have a little preface to introduce the topic. And then I will introduce our presenter for the day, Mr. Nathan Crabb, who is ready to go. But I wanted to just say a few things about the, the, the concept, a little overview, if you will. And first of all, my mother was a librarian. <laughs> and when I was growing up, our house had bookcases everywhere, literally. And nothing in them was off limits to me. I could pick any book and start reading. And mother said, if I had any questions, come see her and we'd talk about it. So I read Orwell's 1984, four years after it was published. It was published in 1949. And uh, after it was published, uh, I was 10 years old when I read Orwell's 1984 and Lady Chatterley's Lover, and a wonderful book about the ghosts of New Orleans. And of course, I read all those children's books like Alice in Wonderland, and Huckleberry Finn, and Winnie the Pooh, all of which were subsequently banned. Winnie the Pooh, excuse me. I was a corrupted little thing. I titled this course, Contemporary Heresies, Book Banning and the Suppression of Ideas. So to introduce the class, I want to just take a few minutes to look at why it is in the first part of the 21st century that we are looking at this dramatic rise in the attempt to limit the free flow of ideas and why that is so important for us and our democracy. Contemporary heresies. Free expression and freedom of speech are the cornerstones of American democracy. Yet the interpretation of the First Amendment continues to be a flashpoint in the 21st century as the nation debates how to apply these rights to our society. Books have power. And for some, that power is seen as dangerous. Book banning and attempts to censor books have existed for a very long time. In the present day, individuals and groups still actively petition the removal of books from schools, libraries, and bookstores. Book banning parties. The term heresy, why did I use that? Well, it's used not only with regard to religion, but also in the context of political theory. These expanded metaphoric senses allude to both the difference between the person's view and the mainstream and the boldness of such a person in pro uh, proposing these ideas. In 399 BCE, the Athenian philosopher Socrates was executed by the Athenian court on charges of impiety and corrupting the youth. As Supreme Court Justice William Brennan Jr. in Texas versus Johnson said most eloquently, if there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. I think we need him back. I don't. <laughs> of these words of Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas in the One Un-American Act, restriction of free thought and free speech is the most dangerous of all subversions. It is the one un-American act that could most easily defeat us. Think about that. Book banning, a form of censorship, occurs when private individuals, government officials, or organizations remove books from libraries, school reading lists, bookstore shelves, simply because they object to their content, their ideas, or their themes. 
The American Library Association promotes the freedom to choose or the freedom to express one's opinions, even if that opinion might be considered unorthodox or unpopular, and stresses the importance of ensuring the availability of those viewpoints to all who wish to read them. Recently, the American Library Association, ALA here, said that there were more attempts to ban books in 2021 than ever recorded since the ALA began tracking challenges to books in the year 2000. Their Office for Intellectual Freedom counted 729 challenges to library, schools, and university materials compared to 156 just five years ago. Deborah Caldwell Stone, the director of ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom, said many of these book challenges are driven by social media and target stories about people of color. We're disheartened, she said, that there is this organization campaign, organized campaign, to remove the voices of marginalized communities from the shelves of school libraries. We're particularly disheartened that elected officials who do have a duty to uphold the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are pressing forward with efforts to remove these books as well. The recent efforts to control the free flow of ideas comes in two steps. The first is to file a challenge. A challenge is an attempt to remove or restrict materials based upon the objections of a person or a group. The next step is to ban the book entirely. A banning is to remove the removal of those challenged materials. Challenges do not simply involve a person expressing a point of view, rather they're an attempt to remove material from the curriculum or library, thereby restricting the access of everyone to that material. Across the country, book bans have risen dramatically over the past year, led by far-right politicians intent on stopping kids from learning about race, sexual orientation, gender identity, different cultures, or even just an unbiased history of our country. <laughs> As the English author George Orwell so presciently wrote in 1945, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. So this class is going to explore these and other questions as well as their contemporary relevance by surveying a wide range of examples of books that have been found to be too controversial or too pro provocative to be given wide public access. What are some of the most banned books? Let's look at the top 10. Number one, George Orwell's 1984. The English writer George Orwell has become a frequent reference point in contemporary political discourse, but beyond a concern over the effects of propaganda and the status of truth, what were Orwell's political views? Did he think fascism posed the same threat as communism or that Hitler was as dangerous as Stalin? Was he a defender of democracy, of human rights? How did he reconcile his patriotism with the violence and oppression of British colonialism? Why did he fight in the Spanish Civil War? If all art is propaganda, as Orwell famously wrote, what does that mean about his own literary efforts? Were they propaganda too? Besides Orwell's 1984, here are some of the other books that have been banned. Appropriately, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury is one at the top of the list. 451 degrees, that's the temperature at which paper automatically combusts. And it was the inspiration behind Bradbury's 1953 novel. It provides a terrifying depiction of a world where books are burned and voices are diminished. Here are some of the others, some surprising, most banned books. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, 
The Catcher in the Rye, The Color Purple by Alice Walker, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Angelou. In fact, she is one of the most banned of all authors. Lord of the Flies by William Golding, Of Mice and Men, John Steinbeck. I don't know. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Casey and To Kill a Mockingbird. Talk about, you know, a list of the top books that we have, you know, on bookshelves everywhere. And it's amazing to me that these are the ones that are picked out as having to be banned because they're so controversial. Here's a few others of note. Ulysses by James Joyce. Beloved by Toni Morrison, Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, Slaughterhouse Five, Kurt Vonnegut, Call of the Wild, Jack London, The Jungle, Upton Sinclair, Animal Farm, George Orwell again, The Grapes of Wrath, again, Steinbeck, and interestingly enough, The Holy Bible which was number six of the most challenged books of 2015, according to the ALA. The challenge was on the grounds that the Bible contained religious viewpoints that, that public schools should not be promoting. And it also was noted that in some cases the Bible had explicit sexual content. <laughs> Banned children's books. We're going to have a whole session on that. Ramona Carpenegro is going to be here to talk about banned children's books. And they include Alice in Wonderland, The Wizard of Oz, Winnie the Pooh, Harry Potter, Anne Frank, and most recently, Mouse. Do you know why they wanted to ban Winnie the Pooh? It had talking animals in it. <sighs> Over the next six weeks, a group of journalists, librarians, and scholars, including Jean Ewart, Sylvia Ashwell, Brandon Wolf, Philip Wagner, Ramona Carponegro, and Paul Ortiz, will highlight and discuss some of the most important examples of what has become an outrageous attack on freedom of expression and freedom of speech in our threatened democracy. Our first guest in the series is Nathan Crabb. I don't know if you saw the Gainesville Sun this morning, but uh, Mr. Crabb had a very nice column on this topic of banned books right there on the opinion page. And he is, in fact, the opinion and engagement editor for the Gainesville Sun. His responsibilities include writing opinion columns and editorials, along with editing guest columns and letters to the editor. He has been with the paper since 2005, previously working as a reporter on the University of Florida. Before that, he investigated wrongful convictions for the Innocence Institute of Point Park University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and covered the environmental and county beats as a reporter for the Napa Valley Register in Napa, California. He currently lives in Gainesville with his wife and two children. Please welcome Nathan Crabb. Um, yeah, that was a great presentation. I, I learned something and uh, I really want to thank you guys for, and for inviting me here today. It's always a pleasure to come to um, Okamic. Um, you know, some of our most loyal readers are, are here and uh, some of uh, our most loyal contributors in terms of letters to the editor and guest columns. So I, uh, I really um, always enjoy uh, coming here. And, and it's always a smart crowd that, that uh, asks uh, interesting things. So I hope we have a, a good uh, discussion uh, after this. Um, you know, as you can tell from the, the introduction, I'm not a scholar on, on these issues. I'm uh, just some, happen to be someone who, um, you know, writes uh, writes the written word due to due to my profession, so so values that very much, and uh, also happens to be a, a fan of uh, many of those uh, banned uh, 
uh, books that were uh, were cited in the introduction. Um, but what I do know is that uh, as long as there have been books um, expressing controversial or provocative ideas, uh, there have always been uh, authority figures uh, seeking to ban them. Um, you know, nearly 2,000 uh, years ago, uh, the Roman uh, Emperor Caligula banned the reading of the Odyssey because it expressed great ideas of freedom. Um, in the centuries since then, there are numerous examples of government and church leaders banning books that uh, threaten their authority. Uh, in 1559, the Roman Catholic Church established a list of books banned for church members that stayed in place till 1966. Pretty amazing. Um, you know, the column that I wrote today uh, in the Sun was 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 mentioned, and in that column I I, I talk about. I grew up in um, in Akron, Ohio, in Northeast Ohio. Catholic school boy, um, uh, so was my uh, my father, and uh, we used to have um, uh, a Catholic uh, newspaper called the Universe Bulletin up in, in Northeast Ohio. And and as I wrote in there, they used to put a list of banned movies in there that if you would be committing a sin if you uh, if you watched. So that Catholic Church banned book list morphed into a banned movie list, um, at least while that paper was published. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm again a journalist and, and not a scholar of history or, or, or literature. Thankfully, it sounds like you um, you folks have a wonderful array of, of, of very uh, smart and thoughtful people coming to speak in the weeks to come, who can give you more of a scholarly perspective on this issue. Um, but as a journalist, I'm you know they always say journalism is the first draft of, of of history, and so I'll give you that first draft of what's been happening in uh, in in recent months and and, and years in terms of of the United States and specifically Florida in terms of banned books and talk a little bit about uh, specifically um, what legislatively has happened that's kind of led to some of this uh, renewed efforts to ban books. Um, you know, I, it was met, already mentioned, but I'll mention it again because I think that uh, it's worth it's worth uh, citing. The American Library Association recorded 729 book challenges targeting 1,597 titles in 2021. That was the highest number uh, since it began collecting that data in, in 2000. And, uh, and really, um, the, these efforts have been fueled by um, uh, mostly, if not exclusively, Republican-controlled legislatures and Republican governors uh, signing into law um, uh, measures that make uh, book manning uh, easier. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, some of those today. Um, you know, these are among the many culture war battles we've seen in, in recent years. Um, you know, the culture wars have, have been waged for, for, for a long time, but I think that uh, during the Trump years, I think we've seen uh, some of these culture war issues really flare up. And, uh, and that even became more so during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, um, most of the folks in this room today are wearing masks, but, uh, but obviously there was uh, quite a bit of controversy in terms of the requirements of masks in the state of Florida and specifically in our school system. Um, and, and, and certainly there were some, some things that parents, um, you know, had some frustrations about uh, fairly so in, in terms of schools being closed for, for an extended period of time and, and these sort of things. And this, these, um, these issues kind of really gave birth to a, um, a, a more of a parent movement, if you will, among conservative parents to fight back against these mask mandates and, um, and uh, other COVID-19 safety precautions. They kind of brought them into school board meetings to a much a greater degree than than um, than had been ever happened before. You know, as a journalist, I've covered a lot of government meetings, and the truth of the matter is, average citizens don't show up to most of these meetings. There there are a couple um, um, gad citizen gad gadflies, if you will, that show up to every meeting. Um, there are are some folks uh, that will show up when when our very important issues are, are discussed, but most government meetings you won't see a lot of members of the public. So that really changed, I think, during the pandemic in terms of. Some of the uh, backlash, um, particularly among conservative parents, to the COVID-19 measures, and that really is kind of um, uh, the, the founding issue that a lot of these groups have kind of organized, started organizing around. Um, and one of those groups is called Moms for Liberty, and Moms for Liberty was founded by uh, former school board members in Brevard and Sarasota counties, along with the wife of the vice chairman of the Florida Republican Party. So again, they, this was a group originally formed to fight mask mandates that. Um, that then kind of moved on to these other culture war issues, including um, including banning books. Um, so obviously, as you see, that the the vice chair of the the Republican Party of Florida's uh, wife was was instrumental in, in forming this group, and and that gives you some indication of of kind of the political nature of all this. Um, you know, the Republican Party in, in, in Florida and beyond obviously sees uh, this as a big issue in terms of motivating and mobilizing their their voter base. 
Um, and I think they've done it very effectively in, in some cases. And I think the best example of that is in the state of Virginia. Um, if you follow politics, you'll know that Glenn Youngkin uh, was elected governor of Virginia on a, a campaign in which he emphasized um, banning uh, so-called divisive topics uh, in schools, such as critical race theory. Now, never mind that critical race theory wasn't necessarily being taught in, in any schools, but it became a uh, issue that pro pro provoked people and, and got people out to these school board meetings and to vote for him. And, and, and he won on those issues. So I think here in the state of Florida, you, we have a governor, Governor Ron DeSantis, who is following a similar playbook as he runs for, for re-election and, and very likely um, uh, the presidency of the United States. So I think that there's a very political uh, reason that these issues are um, coming to the forefront uh, at this moment in time. Um, so the Florida legislature passed and DeSantis signed into law three measures uh, this year that eased the way for challenges uh, to school library books, textbook, textbooks, and other instructional uh, materials. And I'll talk with you a little bit about those. Um, at the same time, he's given unprecedented attention uh, to school board races. Governors usually don't get involved in school board races. Schools are typically seen as, as local issues. And in fact, uh, school board races are, are technically nonpartisan, meaning people don't run as Democrats or Republicans. But, but they've become very politicized uh, this year. Um, the governor sent out a survey to school board candidates across the state, asking them uh, about issues such as critical race theory, I'm sure, and some of these hot button cultural issues, and then has endorsed candidates um, uh, based on their responses to these surveys, including uh, at least one uh, candidate here locally. So, um, so yeah, so the, obviously this is this issue seen as a political winner, and uh, you see that um, um, playing out here in, in Florida politics. Um, so the three measures that, uh, that Governor DeSantis signed into law include House Bill uh, 1467, which makes it easier for parents to force uh, library books and uh, instructional uh, materials that they object to uh, out of schools. Then there was the so-called Don't Say Gay Bill, House Bill 1557. Now, someone will certainly, certainly correct me that it's not called Don't Say Gay. I think parental rights and education, it's a specific name, but I think Don't Say Gay has become a shorthand for it. Um, uh, I, I believe it's actually a fair characterization, even though some would question that. Um, uh, that bill puts limits on what can be said in schools about sexual orientation and, and gender identity. And uh, finally, there's the so-called Stop Woke Act, and that's an, actually the, the, not the name of it either, but the name that DeSantis has, has put on it, that's HB7, uh, which restricts how uh, race and gender are uh, discussed in schools. And again, if you talk with um, proponents of these bills, um, you know, they can make them sound completely reasonable. Um, you know, supporters of, of the Don't Say Gay bill, for example, um, claim that it only restricts classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity in kindergarten through third grade. Well, who could object to that? What do kindergartners or through third graders know about these things? Why are we in supposedly instructing them um, on it? Now, I would, I would argue that, that that's a, a, a false narrative, but um, that's, that's one you'll hear. Um, the bill, what you don't hear as much is the bill also includes provisions restricting such discussions in all grades in a manner that is, quote, not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate. Now, here's where it gets tricky. What does that mean? Is it, was, it wasn't defined very well in the bill, one might suggest purposefully slow, so, so because it leaves, um, that vagueness leaves interpretation up to um, individual school districts for now because the state really hasn't given very specific guidelines on it. And I would argue causes a, a chilling effect uh, as a result. Um, the law also allows parents to sue if they think their district violated the law, and if they lose that lawsuit, the, the school districts have to cover the cost. So I'm talking about a chilling effect. Uh, you're, you're afraid of violating a law that you're not really sure what it means, um, but you kind of have a vague idea, and if you don't do it right, you can be sued and have to pay, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in court costs in, in a school district that already probably doesn't have a, a very easy time uh, paying the bills with uh, the way education is funded. So uh, that to me is, 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 is what I mean by chilling effect, and, and these districts are going to err on the side of caution in terms of what they, uh, they allow in classrooms, even if it's going well above and beyond what the law supposedly um, limits. Um, you'll see that already. Some districts have, you know, had teachers, told teachers you can't put, you know, some teachers put a sticker on their, uh, their door saying it is a safe space for LGBT students, a rainbow sticker, telling them those are a no-go, some districts have said. Even, even um, some districts have, have, have uh, cautioned um, LGBT Teachers, don't put a, um, a picture of your same-sex spouse on your desk out of fear that that would violate the law. So I think that, um, that this kind of uh, chilling effect 
um, is is exactly the purpose of this law is that is that it, it really scrubs the the idea that the LGBT folks can even acknowledge who they are um, out of classrooms. Um, but you know, my focus here today is on books. Um, so I'm going to mention a couple examples how the law is playing out uh, in that regard. Um, and, and again, this chilling effect can be seen in places like Broward County Public Schools, which donated boxes and boxes of, of books that had, uh, you know, L LGBTQ characters, authors, themes um, to a LGBTQ museum down there. And their excuse was, oh, we have, we just got to clear out some space. You know, we have all these space needs and these books were taking up a lot of space. Uh, Fooey, if you ask me, it was a couple weeks before Don't Say Gay uh, took into effect, uh, came into effect. Uh, so I think that timing was not uh, coincidental. Um, Brevard County uh, School District told teachers not to have classroom libraries. If you know, if, if you've ever been to a classroom from, from childhood on, you know, you, you know, to your own children being classroom, you know that teachers often have little mini libraries in their classrooms as a way, you know, quiet time in the morning, let the kids get a book from the, from, from the, um, from the school library and do something rather than, than make a lot of noise in the classroom. It's kind of a nice thing that teachers have and encourage reading and this sort of thing. Well, uh, Brevard County said, nah, get rid of the classroom libraries. It could have one of these objectionable, an objectionable title in there and we don't want to so open ourselves up to, to, uh, to, to, to a lawsuit. Um, so so I, I really think that that chilling effect is just already being started to being seen and I think we'll see it even more as the school years begin. Um, House Bill 1467 is also started having an effect by creating an avenue for groups like Moms for Liberty to challenge books. Um, on uh, LGBTQ topics, and as well as those involving race, uh, religion, and uh, anything else they find objectionable. Um, you know, it was mentioned uh, during the previous presentation that Slaughterhouse Five is among the titles that have been challenged. I, I, I was surprised by that. I'm, uh, I've always been a big Vonnegut fan. I'm sure there are others in here who, who like Kurt Vonnegut's work, um, and uh, and I was kind of surprised. You know, maybe seeing that challenged. 40 years ago might have been a little less surprising, but that, that being challenged, that book being challenged in 2022 to me is, is, is pretty uh, remarkable. Um, if you haven't read it, uh, Slaughterhouse Five uh, kind of combines uh, sci fi elements with Vonnegut's story of being um, um, in Dresden uh, during the bombing there. And, and to me, conveys really, um, you know, uh, uh, the feelings of the horrors and the atrocities of war and as, as, experience, as he personally experienced uh, there. Um, but for Moms for Liberty, they objected apparently to violence. You know, uh, you're writing about World War II and its atrocities, kind of an unavoidable aspect of it. Uh, sexual content, what it calls inflammatory religious commentary in the novel, um, which Vonnegut, Vonnegut was good about, <laughs> about that kind of satire, and uh, apparently it rubbed the Moms for Liberty the wrong way. Um, but the good news is, is that all these, uh, uh, the, and, all, and all, all of this is that people are fighting back against uh, these censorship campaigns. Um, you know, I wrote about some of this today, so apologies if you've already read that column, I'm gonna repeat it. A high school advanced placement teacher in, in Brevard uh, created an online fundraiser to buy a bunch of copies of Slaughterhouse Five and some of the other, other uh, challenged uh, books to distribute to students um, uh, for summer reading. And in fact, was come, Moms for Liberty came right back and criticized him and used this term groomer that you've heard heard maybe in this debate of suggesting that these teachers are trying to insert terrible thoughts into children's heads and groom them, this sort of horrible stuff. Um, but thankfully, the, the, the India-based uh, Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library uh, also has kind of pushed back and provided free copies of Slaughterhouse Five to students there. So I think that there are, um, there are people who, who care about these issues um, who are, are pushing back against these groups. Um, so here in Alachua County, we've kind of escaped this book banning fervor so far. Um, I called the school district a couple days ago and asked, have there been any specific challenges to books here? And was told there are not. Um, I kind of vaguely mentioned that in my column today because I'm really afraid to give anybody any ideas. And, um, and so uh, cross your fingers that that stays the way it is, but I don't think that's gonna be the case because Moms for Liberty, and, and sorry to keep mentioning them, um, but they really are uh, fueling a lot of this in Florida and uh, they have a chapter here and they're having their national convention in. Um, in Tampa, I believe, uh, this, um, this weekend. So um, I would not be surprised if folks uh, come back um, from that event um, with, uh, with some ideas of books that they might want to challenge on our schools. Um, you know, there are four school board races on this ballot in August, and at least, as I mentioned before, at least one of those candidates was actually appointed by the governor. Um, and um, 
And so this is an issue that I would encourage everyone to ask your school board candidates. I know I think you've already had a, one of these debates relatively recently, but there's no reason you can't contact these candidates individually and, 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 and really nail them down on, on this issue. Now, I, I conducted interviews with pretty much every candidate running for office for school board, city commission, and mayor over the last couple of weeks, and, um, and the school board candidates. I, I did press on this issue, and, and you'll have some candidates that don't want to really say They're, that we're in a, you know, truthfully, a very left-leaning community. Democratic registrations outnumber Republican registrations by a, a good number. Uh, school board races are decided countywide, so it's it's not a winning issue necessarily for a candidate to say they're they're looking to, to get into office to ban a bunch of books. But um, I think you should kind of um, uh, push to see if they support these laws. Push to see exactly what their position on uh, on on the three laws that I, I, I mentioned are, uh, and and you'll find there are some candidates who have already been to school the school board um, raising objections to. Um, instructional material already. So I think that if this issue doesn't become uh, a, a, an issue during the campaign for these candidates, it certainly will become an issue if, uh, if uh, some of the folks are elected. Um, so what else can folks do about, about book banning campaigns? Um, you know, uh, the American Library Association was mentioned, and they really are the leaders on this issue. Um, they publish that list of banned books every year, and um, they've recently formed a group with uh, some other organizations called Unite Against Book Bans that um, offers an online toolkit for telling people what they can do about this. That's at uniteagainstbookbans.org. At um, and uh, you know some of it's pretty obvious. Some of it's send a letter to the editor of your local paper, and I certainly would be interested if any, any folks want to do that. Um, but uh, uh, other stuff is, is more about kind of mobilizing politically being active on this issue. Um, you know, uh, what I mentioned in the column today, and I'll mention here is, and I would also suggest reading some of these books, uh, you know, that book banning list that the American Library Association puts out it can be a, a, a list to kind of look in and see if there's any titles you haven't read and give some support to some of these authors that are facing these, um, these attacks. Um, you know, I, there's been banned book clubs that have formed. Um, the, the newspaper uh, chain that I work for, Gannett, one of the editors there formed a, one of these clubs. And I said it in one of their book readings, but I haven't, I haven't been back uh, to admittedly. Um, but um, you know, they were the ones that, that they that kind of mentioned that Mouse is one of these titles that's been challenged and got me to read that recently. And, and I was glad that I did. I had missed that um, uh, sadly when I was younger and it was a, um, even at this age, an eye-opening book. Um, so, so that's kind of the basic lay of the land here in Florida. You know, really I'm, I'm interested if anyone wants to ask questions or I'll kind of start a discussion on this. Um, you know, I, I, I will open the floor to whatever any, any folks want to talk about. And once again, I thank, I thank you all for having me here today. Hi, I'm, I'm Keith Berg. Um, and that question is, uh, on these various book bannings, we were talking about Broward County and other places, uh, how successful has the challenges to those book bannings been, say from ACLU or whoever? Uh, I mean, are they really re reliably eventually found to be uh, of violating the Constitution or do they get nowhere? That, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the honest answer is I, I need to follow that more closely to kind of follow through some of these. I've kind of followed the early steps of the process. My understanding is that a lot of this stuff is just starting. So we'll see this stuff both wind through the processes that they have in place in terms of challenging books, as well as you suggested the courts if some of these are uh, bans are challenged on, on First Amendment grounds. Um, the, 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 the Moms for Liberty group, uh, we have, uh, and I link this in my story today, uh, you know, Gannett owns a lot of papers in Florida, so we have a paper down there that's covered this pretty well. And they've had three different rounds, my understanding is, from their reporting of this Moms for Liberty group submitting books. The, 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 the Vonnegut book, Slaughterhouse Five, was among, among this latest round. Um, and, and I believe that those are all kind of all in the process of kind of being considered. Um, that state law uh, outlines, just the, basically outlines the process when I say it makes it easier avenue to, to do this. Forever, a parent could come to a school board meeting and complain about a book, but this actually creates this process that you file a formal challenge and the, the board is required to do, do certain things in that regard. So the answer, as far as my understanding is these things are, are, are early enough that, um, that a lot of them are still in the process of happening. So we'll have to wait to see if, uh, how successful they'll be. Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, uh, these ladies uh, 
should concentrate on what's happening in the school. You had an article today about student misbehavior is uncontrollable in the schools and that uh, you can't learn in an atmosphere like that. So in all sincerity, I would say, if there's misbehavior in the classroom and the children can't learn, there's no need to ban books because they won't be able to read them. Now I'm saying I'm not I'm saying that in sincerity. Yeah. About the misbehavior and related to reading. I Thank understand. you. Well, I appreciate your comment. I mean, the point that I would make is, you know, I have two children in, in, in Alachua County Public Schools and elementary school here locally. They're pretty young still. Um, they're 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 not yet in middle school, so I, I'm sure the fun has just begun um, in terms of of of, of their schooling and and uh, all the, the many issues you deal with when your kids uh, enter middle school and beyond. Um, but um, but I I find it kind of I would say comical, but it really isn't funny. The 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 suggestion that books are really what I have to worry about with my children. I mean, they, they have access. Uh, they have devices that can provide them access to. Um, all manners of, of objectionable uh, videos and other material that uh, that I, and personally that I'm, I'm far more worried about them reading. I, I'd, I'd be delighted if they if they read uh, more. Um, so the idea that books uh, and, and reading is the thing that I have to worry about with my children. And in fact, the idea that that is where children are getting supposedly getting certain ideas from is, is I also find um, you know comical. But if, if, if it's it's. There's social media out there. There's all these things out there that kids are, kids are being bombarded with all sorts of ideas. So the idea that they're, it's because the librarian at their local school gave them a book and then they got this certain idea in their head that's objectionable to their parents, I think is, is not a very um, realistic depiction of what happens in schools in my personal experience. Thank you. Nathan, uh, thank you so much for coming today. I loved your uh, editorial and also the one that was next door to it, uh, Mr. Simon. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to mention, we have a couple of book clubs here at Oak Hammock. Oh, cool. Uh, your idea of deliberately seeking out some of these books. When I looked at the list, uh, I did see that we have already read some of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in trouble. <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you for that. Well, thank you. And, you know, it, it's worth mentioning that the books that we've cited here, um, Slaughterhouse Five, um, of, of Mice and Men, um, To Kill a Mockingbird, some of these classics are not necessarily the majority of books that are the focus of these major challenge, these, these recent challenges. There are books that deal, a lot of books that deal with LGBT. Uh, Q issues in particular that are on that list that are more contemporary. I, I read one of them, All Boys Are Blue, um, as part of that Gannett book club that I, that I mentioned. And it certainly, um, it certainly is a lot different than, than um, books that I was uh, shown as a younger child. I think that um, the idea is that um, there are marginalized groups that didn't have the ability to um, reach a wider audience through books uh, when I was growing up, and I'm, I'm sure I went to school with a lot of these children that would have appreciated some of these novels that relate experiences like they were, were experiencing. But I think um, particularly when it comes to LGBTQ issues that folks who are um, my age and older um, didn't have that sort of familiarity, comfortable, being comfortable with some of those issues that, that we see today. And I think that's a societal thing. Once again, I don't know if that school's necessarily uh, teaching that per se, but I think that as a society, obviously we've, we've, we've come a long way in terms of things like same-sex marriage and so forth. So I think that if you're looking at some of these titles uh, for, to read, you might recognize that there are a lot beyond those classic titles that get banned and uh, uh, things about LGBTQ issues, things about racial issues from this perspective of folks from those communities that didn't necessarily get aired and weren't necessarily uh, widely available um, when when all of us might have been in school and um, and uh, think about what what it means for a, a child who has that experience to be able to uh, read a book that um, that they can relate to in that respect. Uh, this is Bob Vernstein, not Elizabeth. And I, 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 I abhor the idea of somebody telling me what I can or my grandchildren can or cannot cannot read. But I wonder if book banning actually uh, has a reverse effect. Well, this book must be this book is banned. There must be something really hot in that. I want to read this book. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, 
So I grew up, uh, you know, um, I'll date myself in terms of exactly when I was a, a, a high schooler um, and, and middle schooler, uh, you know, in the, the late 80s, early 90s, I was in middle school and high school. And that was during the um, uh, uh, kind of a panic about music, about um, uh, foul language and music in particular. Tipper Gore, in fact, formed a group, um, the PMRC, I can't remember what that exactly stood for. If, if even that's the right acronym. But anyways, she formed a group about uh, music that had objectionable lyrics. And uh, it led to a um, sticker being put on these objectionable albums that said explicit com content, you know, beware or something to this effect. Um, me and my friends went to the record store and sought out every album with stickers we could buy. Um, so yeah, I think to your point, I think that a lot of this has a, a reverse effect. Thank you for, for your comment. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Sure. One is, could you relate the revised civics curriculum and the training of teachers to this issue? The second question is, to what degree do school boards have the flexibility to adapt the implementation of these onerous laws? Yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, yeah, I think you're right. You know, if I was to broaden beyond those pieces of legislation I mentioned, certainly some there's there's other legislation, and as well as the um, uh, DeSantis appointed um, uh, Board of Education for the state have, have have been very active in terms of shaping the curriculum uh, in in Florida, and um, and yeah, I mean that the the law that that um, talks about uh, the teaching of of uh, or discussions of race and gender in the classroom very specifically has 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 started to affect the curriculum. Uh, how topics such as you know from slavery to the civil rights movement uh, supposedly that the the guiding principle is we're not supposed to make anyone feel bad about their race and, and that I'm not sure I, I don't I don't you can feel feel whatever way you want there's there's certainly a reality of what happened uh, that that I think deserves to be taught regardless of how people react to that reality I think that's on them and and, and uh, but but once again it's had a chilling effect I think already and and some of these guidelines that are being being crafted, um, my understanding is, and, and I'm a, a no expert on this, but I'm starting to read more, is uh, things like um, an, a, a emphasis on religion's role in the founding of our country, um, the downplaying of any idea of a separation of church and state, or some, some ideas that are, are, are becoming part of the curriculum. And, um, and so I, I think what you see is, is you know, the thing about DeSantis is, you know, Anyone that says he's dumb is is foolish. He's a, a smart guy. He's uh, Ivy League educated, in fact, and he's very deliberate about what he does. Um, and and what he what he's doing is a very broad um, uh, effort to um, to change what's being taught in schools. And he'll make it be, seem that he's trying to rid the schools of indoctrination. But I would argue, and this is just my opinion. All this is just my opinion. If I haven't given that caveat ar already, but my opinion is. Is is just he's substituting uh, his indoctrination for for his perceived indoctrination that was that was that was there, and there's questions of whether it was even there. So he wants to indoctrinate kids in a sort of specific idea of our country and and the role of religion and 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 race and race and how what is going on with race in our country, and um, he's using all the mechanisms of power to do that. I mean, in terms of being an heir apparent to to. to Donald Trump, DeSantis is very much so, other than the fact that he's effective. He gets legislation passed. Trump never got anything passed when he was in office. DeSantis and the legislature bowed to his every whim over this past session. So we've seen a lot of, of changes in the curriculum, as you mentioned, um, that, um, that reflect that. What was your second question? So, so again, I'm no expert on this, but my understanding is that um, the 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 school the state, and again, this is a contradiction that, that one might argue in terms of the conservative idea of, of local control, but the, the state has been very, um, very deliberate with its preemptive measures that, 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 that give very little wiggle, wiggle room for school districts. Um, I think you saw that in the mask issue, the mask debate, right? So our school district tried to, tried to require masks. Um, uh, DeSantis initially was, you know, used the power of, of his administrative appointments to, to try to punish the district and then had a law passed to try to punish the district. Now, the way things turned out is that they didn't get money taken away from them from, for all this, um, thankfully. But, but the reality is any school district that thinks about defying him knows that that's, that's the way that he operates and that he will go as far and the legislature will go as far as to take money away from your district if, if, if you um, go against the state. So I think there has both been an effort to 
give very little wiggle room to school boards as well as what wiggle room they have to scare the heck out of them so that they don't, don't uh, defy the governor. Thank you. Thank Elizabeth you. Renner, I see you're unmuted. Do you have a question? I don't have a question. Okay. I have a right. story. I was an English teacher in Pinellas County. Traditionally, at Christmas time, we read the Christmas Carol aloud. I was challenged by a parent and faced with the possibility that I would have to put an individual program for that one student. I asked to meet with the parent. And uh, I asked first what the objection was. Uh, the objection was the part about the angels. Hmm. And I countered with the wonderful uh, opportunity to read at first classical for a 12 or 13 year old and, and have an experience with the language of Dickens. Uh, that's just a one inch, of, but a lot of the school parents are challenging individual things that we're doing. I hate to think that we're going to have to have control over what we teach. Very sad. Yeah, thank you for your comments. And, and, that, and it's worth noting that this kind of efforts go both way. I mean, the, the idea of, of bring, uh, you know, removing anything, even citing religion in schools. Now, I believe in the separation of church and state, but I also believe that there is uh, that is a, a huge part of our country and religion is, and, and people, uh, when you're growing up, need to understand religious movements and understand even religious texts when you're growing, growing up. So I think that, that, that there is certainly goes both ways in terms of people trying to take things out of the, out of the classroom. We've always thought that library boards were non-political. And according to your article and also to someone that I spoke to this morning from Sanibel Island, we have now learned that, that people are trying to ban books in, on Sanibel, the idyllic location in Florida. And they, these two women have not been successful in getting the books banned, so they are now running for the library board so that they can vote them out. Yeah. Well, so we need more good people on library boards. Thank you so much for your comments. Yeah, just just to, um, to if for folks that didn't read the column today, so in addition to my column running today, I ran a column by Howard Simon, who's the former head of the ACLU of Florida. Uh, Howard related this experience in Sanibel that um, that there was uh, parents who saw a display in their local library for Pride Month, objected to it. Um, but rather than taking the channels that one has to object to such things, made a political issue out of it and now are, are running for the school board. And I think, or I'm sorry, running for the library association or, or library board. Um, and I think that that's what you see is that the goal of some of these efforts is not necessarily even about getting the books away from children. It's, it's not really about projecting children, it's about political power. Yeah. Um, so. Catherine Morsink, I'm wondering if the unintended consequence, or perhaps intended, of all of this stuff is the elimination of the public schools I, I thank you for your comment. I think that um, I think you're 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 onto something. I mean, I think that all these things that you see that have happened, and uh, specifically in the last a couple decades in Florida, are kind of chipping away at, at people's faith in public schools, chipping away in the idea of of giving them other options to to go to to different different schools, whether they be charter schools or or, or, or private schools through vouchers. So. Um, you know, one one could argue certainly that school choice has its benefits, and particularly with charter schools, that there are some schools that aren't served well by the school system. But one might also argue that that this is part of a broader movement to to do away with public education, and these are just steps in in that direction. And 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 if if you get parents to think that their schools are are threatening to their children in regards to the thing the material that's being taught, that somehow children are being indoctrinated or groomed. It's a very powerful message to to get people to not send their children to public schools, and to your point, to eventually lead, lead to their demise. I'm an Okamak resident. I'm Sybil Farwell. I am a retired school librarian in Florida. Oh, good. And I have a couple of comments here. Please, you're the expert, so you, I defer to you. You know more than I do about this issue. 
<laughs> one of the things that has been written about in the press in Florida during these legislative months is that through the school boards, each school, public school, has to have a selection committee for the library. That is a way some of these parents have been in some of the counties saying that they wanted to be a part of that selection committee. Traditionally, the school librarian is the head of that selection committee. Okay. And if you had these parents coming on the selection committee, then that would be a way that these people representing these other opinions could get in there and cause a disruption to the books within the school libraries. And I'd like to make a further point. Please. That is that charter schools are all around us in Alachua County. I have direct experience with several charter schools. I was asked to uh, apply for a position in a new charter school in Miami years ago. My first question was, will the school have a library? And the answer is no. Since I have been here in Gainesville six years, I had someone ask me to work with a charter school in Ocala. And there the situation was they had no school library and they wanted my expertise with a master's degree and a doctorate degree in education, a master's in library science. They wanted my opinions on what books they should make available to their charter school students. So that was an ethical dilemma for me. For many years, I have been a member of FAME, the Florida Association for Media and Education. Each year, they recommend books for contests get, to get children involved with reading. Public libraries support it and make those books available, as do bookstores. Can't find too many bookstores to look in in Gainesville, unfortunately. But if I go to another place in Florida, I can still find bookstores with displays of the Sunshine State Young Readers Award and other types of books. So my dilemma became, do I withhold what I know, because I'm opposed to charter schools taking state money, or is my larger responsibility to perhaps influencing the reading of some of these students right. in a private school? So I decided that it was ethical for me to make known about these uh, books that have been selected. I was on a selection committee for three years when I was in Miami-Dade, and for we were grade three through eight, so we affected elementary school children's readings as well as middle school children's readings. And all the other levels in public schools now have a some type of recommended reading list. Some of them come from English teachers. The one for high school comes through English teachers. Okay. So I decided if they could go to a bookstore and see it, then that might be a way that these parents could be informed that these are books that have been selected right. with professional input. So those are two issues that I'm concerned with, both with school board candidates as our tax money goes to these private schools with no school libraries. I can't say that across the board, but right. the ones I'm familiar with, that's the case. Yeah, that's a shame. I, I, you know, I'm not sure about the charter schools here locally. I think there are some good charter schools here locally, and I'm not sure if they have libraries or not. But I certainly think your point is, is well taken in terms of someone with your level of expertise that there is, there is a, a, a base of knowledge that one should have in making these decisions that that they shouldn't be made willy-nilly. Now, I think that all a lot of this is framed in terms of parental involvement, and I personally, in, in terms of 
uh, just broadly speaking, have no objections to parent, parents being involved in the process of materials for the school uh, being selected. But I think that it's a disingenuous um, argument sometimes that, that, that uh, folks that are, are pushing to be part of this process are not interested in constructively being part of these selections. They're more interested in uh, bomb throwing and uh, figuratively speaking and, and causing uh, uh, controversy than they are in terms of really uh, evaluating in a, in a way that I'm sure that your, your years of, of, of uh, education have taught you and uh, evaluating books and the benefits that they have for children. Yes, Janet Janke, president here. Tuesday night, we heard from all eight school board members that are running for election that were on, up on the stage. And invariably, they were telling about the teacher morale yeah. that is so low. I'm a retired elementary teacher, and I cannot imagine going into a classroom that didn't have books. Yeah. And so that is really, really scary. And they're having trouble getting teachers as more places in the U.S. hear what we're doing in Florida. I think that is going to be a detriment for getting teachers that want to come here and teach in our school system. And the other thing is we sit here and we wonder, you know, what can we do? And one suggestion at the end of your article this morning there is a website to go that you refer to, right. and you'll have to tell them the uh, exact name because okay. I didn't remember it. Sure. But if you sign up for that, you're on a list, so you will keep getting some information. And I think the best thing we can do now is to keep informed as to what is happening, and that is a good way to do it. So you would tell them that website, and Absolutely. I encourage you to sign up to get there information. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments, and I certainly appreciate the perspective of, 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 of teachers in, in, in this discussion. The teachers that I've talked with, um, uh, the impression that I get is that they feel under siege, that, 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 that they're constantly getting beat, beaten up, um, uh, especially by the state uh, in, uh, of Florida uh, uh, lately, and, and that's had an effect on morale. But certainly there are many factors that have an effect on morale, including including pay and, 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 and the way teachers are treated. So I think that there are a lot of things that we can do to improve um, uh, the, the atmosphere for, for teachers and, uh, and not treating them like they're, they're indoctrinating students is, is certainly one of them. I, you know, I know when I first brought my child to the public schools, here, the public school they attend here locally, when they had that you know, meet the teacher kind of experience, one of the first things the teacher did is, oh, we have this library here and pick out a book and you can sit and read quietly of it while I show your your parent around the classroom, and, and, and it's sad if that even that is something that has to be taken away. Yes. Nathan, oh, thank, thank let me Let me mention one word. The, the website is uniteagainstbookbans.org. That's what I was going to say. Thanks to Roy Hunt this morning. He shared that editorial with me, who I shared with Paul Ortiz, but I can share that with everyone enrolled in this course if you'd like. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, back. I have one more thing to say, and that is that the American Library Association, I am a member. I no longer have to pay dues. I was a member for so many years. They have been doing this banned books week every year. Yep. In high schools, it is a regular feature in a library that you do a banned books display. Middle school, yes, not so much elementary. But perhaps now we may have to consider that. And uh, also the other thing I wanted to say is that these uh, in libraries, these uh, committees, selection committees have always had parent representatives. This isn't anything new, but some of these people coming out and now wanting to be a part of this group is an issue and who has the final authority in the selection of the books. That's where damage can be done, as well as another important point that the governor has control over, funding of, of school library programs. There is another issue that I haven't heard raised yet, but it could be down the road. Yeah, thank you again for your comments. Yeah, I think that Sometime in the fall, is it September, the banned book week that Library Association puts on? 
Um, and you know, you'll see displays in libraries sometimes with some of those band titles. And of course, as the, as the um, previous presentation went into, uh, you know, when you see titles like 1984, Fahrenheit 451, um, uh, Brave New World, <laughs> and then we're we're kind of living those things and banning, you know, by banning these these, these books, that kind of um, dystopian future where where um, where information is, is silenced in that way is, is is sadly what we're veering into right right as we speak. So. Any final thoughts? Let me just mention that uh, someone brought up the idea that a banned book uh, was almost like, uh, you know, putting a, a good advertisement out there for a lot of people. Uh, I have a friend who had a book that he wrote banned. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, indeed, sales picked up immeasurably. You know, it was, it was really great. But he said the bad news was he started getting hate mail. Yeah. So it was a trade-off in one sense. Yeah, I mean, as, as someone who, who, um, whose email address is out there and is on social media, um, people, people are pretty awful um, in terms of, there, there's some pretty nasty people out there. I, I shouldn't say that broadly. I think actually people are generally pretty good, but I think that there is a minority of folks out there who are very nasty in terms of what they email and send people through social media that can, can really get you uh, you down, I'm sure, if you're an author having having to receive that kind of kind of stuff. Uh, Nathan, this is just a different perspective. Please. I, I grew up in the 40s and 50s. We knew nothing about the gay community, yeah. nothing. And because of that, the rumors that spread were all wrong. And right. I love the idea that children today are welcoming, understand, respectful understand the humanity that exists. And, um, and so I'm furious about what is going on in our country today that would take that away. Thank you. I, I think that's very well put. And, and I would just add is that you know, I, got, I get calls from, from readers who disagree with what I, what I write on a regular basis. And one called to, to question about this idea of what was going on in our schools, this idea of indoctrination. Uh, you know, she had heard somewhere that this is, you know, this is being forced on kids and the, the, the gay lifestyle is being forced on children in elementary school. And that's what they're trying to stop, which I, I, I tried to say that I, I believe is a false narrative. And in my experience of my, my own children in schools is that at, at the very most what's being taught to children is to be tolerant and respectful to others. And these seem like universal values that we should all we should all be able to get behind, no matter what your perspective is on LGBT. Q issues that um, that our young children are just being taught that if you have classmates or others that are that are different from you to treat those people w nicely and that I mean what, who uh, I don't think everyone should object to that that seems pretty pretty something we should also support. Yeah. I, I do find it sort of interesting as a biology professor that a lot of the I mean the issues that are behind the banning are different than they were I mean. Where is evolution? I mean, that was what was banned, um, you know, 20 years ago. Um, it's it's somehow um, become much more cultural issues than yeah. that, and which was purely religious, really. I mean, that was a strictly religious thing. So, um, yeah. Anyway, what would your comments be to that? I was I'm surprised that there's so little about. Um, issues like evolution that were the big deal 20 years ago. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I certainly think that that was when I was younger, certainly more of a, a thing than, um, than, than some of these issues. Um, I think it's a part of a reflection of our changing demographics. I think that, um, I think that a lot of what's happened in the last 20 years, really, you know, since the election of Obama, there had been a backlash, I think, of, 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 of folks um, and I'm, I'm a white man, so I think I can say this, uh, uh, that I think that there are some uh, segment of our country who saw a black man get elected president and, and did not react well to it and, and, and see the change, changing demographics of our country and, and uh, do not react well to it. And that's fueled a lot of this, um, uh, some of these even white supremacist attitudes we see right now. And, 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 uh, but that goes, you know, so, that, so when we're talking about these book bans, we've mentioned LGBTQ issues a lot, but Race is also a huge factor in, in, in all of this. A lot of these books are giving a perspective of, of uh, people of color and the experiences they've had, which have been, uh, in, in a lot of instances, terrible. And I, I think that um, rather than acknowledge those experiences and, um, 
and, and talk about as a country that we've done wrong and, and, and need to do better, I think there's this backlash to say, um, oh, well, we, we, it's, it's, it's criticizing, it's, it's unpatriotic, or it's somehow criticizing the country by just saying that we've done wrong in the past. And so I think that's, that's a lot of that is woven into this debate uh, as, as well. So just one brief thing before you close. I'm, sometimes I think cartoons are more powerful than words. And one of my favorite things I saw recently about this subject, having read certain books over and over and over to children and grandchildren, was the comment that if you are afraid reading a book will turn your child to become gay, someone must explain why I am not a very hungry caterpillar. <laughs> that, is, that is a wonderful comment. Yeah, and, and just to... Uh, I'm sure we're going to close on that, but uh, you know, I, I did bring my bring my uh, edition of Mouse um, that, I, that I just got here in terms of picture pictures saying a lot, um, being being powerful, and and you know, I, if you are adding anything to your band book clubs, I would I would recommend Mouse very 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 much. So it's it actually was a lot different than I expected it was because a lot of it is about the cartoonist himself and his experience getting these stories from his father, um, but it's very very real and uh, brings those stories home in a a very powerful way and the illustrations which what's called mouse because the jewish characters are portrayed as mice and the, the nazis portrayed as, as cats and, and, and some of the other uh, nationalities in europe have, have other animals they're portrayed as but um but it's it, i think a powerful way of, of of telling the story and as you say pictures are sometimes more powerful than words so i'd recommend it nathan and mallory we can't thank you enough for your time today thank you, thank you everyone for joining us <laughs>